sea, mando grabar la conferencia por Skype y las preguntas se hacen por Skype. Las preguntas se hacen por Skype. ¿Cuál es? Bueno, continuamos con nuestra anteúltima actividad del día, que es el momento de presentar a Jeremy Shearmour de la Universidad Nacional de Australia. Eh, nuestro conferencista nos ha enviado eh, un, un video con su locución, tras el cual vamos a tomar preguntas de los asistentes eh, e intentaremos comunicarnos con él por, por vía telefónica. Este, y va, va a responder las, las consultas que le acerquemos. Vamos a dejar todo en potencial, <risa> claro, por los, los riesgos implícitos de la tecnología, los cuelgues, el internet, etc. Queremos que salga todo bien. Eh, Jeremy Shemur tiene varios libros publicados, es un hombre formado en la London School of Economics, eh, que ha enseñado en la Universidad de Edimburgo, en la Universidad de Manchester y en George Mason que fue director de estudios del Center for Policy Studies en Londres. Eh, trabajó unos ocho años como asistente de Sir Karl Popper y publicó, bueno, el famoso libro, conocido libro de Political Thought of Karl Popper y también, especialmente, Hayek and After. Vamos a ver la conferencia. Ladies and gentlemen, my topic today is Popper and Hayek, two paths to the critique of planning. First of all, a little bit by way of thanks, but also regrets. May I start indeed by thanking you for the invitation to join you at this conference and to express my regrets for the fact that I can't be with you physically. I'd have loved to have joined you but the conference is in the middle of our teaching period. I would also have loved to have visited Argentina, a country which has always seemed to me most interesting, and which I have had the greatest affection for ever since Carlos Tevez was responsible for rescuing West Ham, almost single-handed, from what I fear was amply deserved relegation from the British Premier Soccer League a couple of years ago. Let me turn at once to my lecture. My concern will be with aspects of the interrelationship between Friedrich Hayek and Karl Popper, both of whom I've studied over many years, and with the latter of whom, Karl Popper, I worked for some eight years as his assistant. I will, in this lecture, draw not just on my reading of their work, but also on archive research, on some of which uh, I uh, haven't previously published. And I'm also going to be drawing on some of the recent work of Bruce Caldwell, to whom all students of Hayek's work owe a great deal. On the 5th of June, 1944, Karl Popper wrote to his friend, the art historian Ernst Gombrich. Gombrich was trying to place Popper's open society with a publisher in Britain. And Popper asked Gombrich to insert, following the text of the book, that's to say between the text and the notes, the date on which the text of the book was completed. Why? Well, Popper had just received a copy of Hayek's Road to Serfdom, and he was worried that people might think that he'd taken ideas without acknowledgement from Hayek's work. There were indeed certain striking similarities between their books. Both were critical 
of the contemporary enthusiasm for the large-scale planning of society. Both books were critical of historicism and ideas about historical inevitability. Both books were ethically individualistic at a time when there was widespread enthusiasm for ethical collectivism. And indeed, there were many other resemblances between their views. Hayek and Popper were also to become friends. Popper, too, was at the first meeting of Hayek's Montpereland Society. Popper had indeed suggested to Hayek that he might invite a number of non-collectivist socialists to join the gathering, a suggestion which Hayek didn't take up. Hayek and Popper referred approvingly to one another's work. They also dedicated books to each other. And as a result, Hayek and Popper have often been seen as allies, which I think is correct, but their views have sometimes been assimilated, which I think is incorrect. In this lecture, I'll say a little about some of the differences that there are between them. Let me start, though, with a bit by way of biography. Popper and Hayek were both Austrian. They both lived in Vienna, and they were near contemporaries. Hayek was a few years older than Popper. But they first met in London just before World War II. The reason was that while they both came from upper middle class, academically oriented families, their background and their concerns were very different. Popper's family was Jewish, although they had formally converted to Lutheranism as a gesture of assimilation. As Hayek has explained, though, intellectual life in Austria operated in rather different circles, so that, say, Freud's sister was a family friend of the Poppers, while Hayek's friendships would have been in non-Jewish and mixed circles. Popper's father was an affluent scholarly lawyer, but the family became impoverished in the economic collapse after the First World War. Popper, in his mid-teens, became a Marxist, and he actually worked briefly in the headquarters of the small Communist Party in Austria. He was, however, quickly disillusioned. He's written about this at some length, but he remained initially a socialist. Indeed, as I'll mention later, he was known to Rudolf Carnap, a key figure in the Vienna circle, as a fellow socialist. He moved, this is Popper, from his family's apartment into disused barracks, which were being used as accommodation by a number of radical young people. Popper attended lectures at the university, worked within a socialist youth movement, and worked as a social worker uh, in a setting connected with the psychologist Alfred Adler. Popper qualified as a teacher. He realized, however, that despite his academic interests, as someone of Jewish background, it was hopeless to aspire to a university position in Austria. Popper studied psychology, but he also had strong interests in physics, in mathematics, and in philosophy. And out of these things developed, but I think rather more slowly than Popper's own accounts of this might suggest, his philosophy of science. I won't elaborate on these aspects of Popper's life, as Malachi Kai Harkoen has brilliantly told the story of all this in his book on Popper's early development. Three things, I think, needed to be noted. First, Popper was not an economist. And indeed, one of the key differences between his views and those of Hayek is that Popper's work, and thus his political thought, doesn't have an economic background. In addition, Popper wasn't involved in the kinds of discussions around Ludwig von Mises about the philosophy of the social sciences that had an important role in the shaping of Hayek's views. By contrast, with regard to methodology, one important influence on Popper 
was Karl Polanyi. He was the brother of Michael Polanyi and an independent-minded Christian socialist. It was Karl Polanyi who was later to write The Great Transformation. Popper mentions Polanyi's influence in, on his ideas in the methodology of the social sciences. But there seem to be important resemblances concerning their ideas about democracy as well. Popper favors there a view that he called protectionism. This isn't economic protectionism, but rather the view that it's the task of the state to protect individual citizens. What gets protected, however, isn't just their individual liberty, but also their freedom from, for example, what Popper sees as economic exploitation. All this, however, is to operate within the framework of the rule of law. Second, Popper got to know the philosopher Julius Kraft. Kraft was interested in the version of the ideas of the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, which were developed by, again, a German philosopher called Leonard Nelson. Kraft and Popper debated these ideas at length. Immanuel Kant's ideas, Leonard Nelson's ideas, and Popper's encounter with this influenced his work in the philosophy of science. There was, however, another side to Nelson, namely that he favored a kind of high-minded socialist revival of Plato's ideas as an alternative to democracy. Nelson's ideas here indeed went beyond the theoretical and an organization was set up to instantiate his ideas and indeed a formal attempt was made to recruit Popper into Nelson's organization. Popper declined the invitation but all this also left its mark on Popper. For Popper's critique of the platonic view of leadership in the open society was initially developed as a result of his critical reflections on Nelson. A third issue related to Popper's epistemology or his theory of knowledge. Popper's ideas in the theory of knowledge led him to become a fallibilist. That's to say, someone who thought that even our best claims to knowledge, things by which Popper was really impressed, such as Einstein's work, while they were impressive, were also fallible. Further, all our knowledge in Popper's view stands in need of correction and improvement from the criticism of others. This plays an important role in his epistemology and philosophy of science, where Popper is a critic of relativism, but also a critic of foundationalism, of the idea that our knowledge should be constructed from firm starting points which could never be called into question. But Popper also thought such criticism was particularly important in the social sciences and in public policy. Popper stressed that all our actions, and particularly our policies, are not only fallible, but might also lead to unintended consequences which may be undesirable, and this might lead to human suffering. For Popper, critical feedback was vital, and the idea also was that we should work tentatively in a piecemeal manner in trying to address social problems and that what we did should be open to criticism and reappraisal. And this kind of notion, this notion of openness to criticism from everyone played a key role in Popper's ideas about the open society.